get started. All right, it's 420, so time to get started. Um, so I'm Brian Curtin. This is Terry Howe. Uh, I work for Rackspace. He's for HP. And we're here to talk about the uh, OpenStack SDK, uh, what it is, how it came to be, what's going on with it. Um, so I first wanted to start by saying, what actually is this? Um, so the OpenStack SDK is, is a way to kind of, cons or, you know, it's a project we're, we're working on to consolidate efforts uh, to work on developer experience uh, across OpenStack, uh, across all the clients, all the tools, all the libraries. Um, and it's a step towards having kind of the one-stop shop uh, to work with OpenStack. Uh, right now, there's kind of, as you know, a lot of different clients and different ways to do things, um, trying to make one unified uh, solution that uh, hopefully improves and, and gives people a better experience working with OpenStack, whether they're uh, vendors, clients of vendors, uh, developers, um, any type of developer, whether you're a you know, core developer of one of the projects, you're an end user building applications on OpenStack, um, all across the board. Uh, and so kind of looking at, you know, why do we kind of need this? Um, so as OpenStack has grown uh, in terms of adoption, in terms of uh, the feature offering, I mean, literally everything about this has grown, looking at the conference, looking at the, the marketplace, all of the, everything is significantly larger than, you know, if you look at the, uh, the Austin release versus Ice House, the release notes are eight times larger. The, the feature offering is significantly larger. Stack Forge is growing all the time. Um, and what this has kind of led to is, you know, well now we have roughly 30, if you count, count both OpenStack and, and, and the StackForge repos, um, I think there are now up to 30-something projects. Uh, each of them has implemented their own client, um, most of whom have copied things from uh, other places. And a lot of, there's a lot of duplication, fragmentation, and uh, the three kind of main things you see um, as the, the project has grown is that there's a lot of fragmentation. Um, has led to a lot of duplication, and it's led to a lot of in inconsistency in, in interfaces and usages. Um, so if you look at the fragmentation across um, across OpenStack, you know we see, like I was saying, that there's 30 different clients. They're all written by different people for the most part. Um, they're all different packages. So I, I don't think anyone's building stuff that uses all 30 of these projects. But even for a small number of uh, different services, um, you're consuming a, a bunch of different packages with different varying levels of documentation. They're used even the slightest bit differently. Um, and those differences really do add up. Um, different, uh, different contributors work on different projects. You know, that's you know, all fine and good. People have different things they want to work on. Um, but you know, that leads to different design kind of ideas. People have different ideas of how things should be used. So even a, a service that works with another service could be implemented by a different person that has different ideas on how things should work. So, you know, things don't work um, as uniformly across the board as you would, would hope. Uh, and so some of that fragmentation has led to a lot of duplication. Um, so looking into a lot of the client implementations or any of the tools, um, you see one common thread that everyone has mostly written their own HTTP uh, client. Um, a lot of them you can tell are copy and pasted. Some of the more recent projects have inherited, for lack of a better term, um, although not actually inheriting uh, in the OO sense, um, the, you know, the, the, the HTTP class from someone else. Um, a lot of them come from Swift or Nova or something like that. Um, and if you look at how the, the big three, the originals, um, Nova, Glance, and Swift have, have built their HTTP class, um, two of them are built on requests.session, which is the fairly common way. Um, Nova uses, a, it's written its own connection pool that under the hood can use sessions. And that's done, I'm sure, for a perfectly great reason. Uh, I'm not trying to slam that. I'm just saying that there are differences that, that immediately we're, we're only looking at three things and we see two different implementations. Um, then you step into just how they're named. They're named differently. One of them is HTTP connection. One of them is something else. Um, they also stretch beyond just doing HTTP things. Uh, I believe it's the Swift one. Or, I'm, one of them ends up doing authentication for you. The others have authentication classes that work with those. Um, so really, we have three. And just looking at three projects in, in the first ones I looked at, we have three different implementations of roughly the same thing. Um, so that fragmentation has led to this duplication, which in the end leads to some inconsistencies um, across all these projects. Um, so if we look at um, listing resources, uh, one of the, the simple first things you might do when you 
import any of these or, or work with these. Um, so in Swift, you have containers. In Nova, you have servers. In Glance, you have images. Uh, to list the containers in uh, Swift, you call git underscore account uh, because you do a get request on the slash account uh, endpoint in the REST API. And that gives you a tuple of uh, some metadata and then the container information. If you do servers.list in Nova, that gives you a list of servers. That's pretty straightforward. If you do, uh, in Glance, if you do images.list, that returns a generator of images. Um, I prefer generators myself, but um, if you look at that, once again, three things doing three fairly simple uh, operations in three entirely different ways and named two different ways. Um, so this is all kind of adding up you know, as you start to build um, applications that use multiple OpenStack services, the differences are mounting up. And no matter what type of user you are, if you're someone in this room who's flying to Paris to go to a conference about OpenStack, you're probably you know, on the higher end of technical ability. Some of you can deal with this. We have you know, customers who are not even sure what Nova means. They just want servers. And then they look at, at, at this and, and see all these differences, different ways to work with things, all these different de dependencies. Um, and from multiple angles of in the OpenStack community, this is not really a great experience. So this project kind of came around to focus on getting one place to consume OpenStack, whether you're an end user, you're uh, a developer of one of the services that consumes another service, um, you're an operator, you're anyone who's doing anything with OpenStack. Um, and it's I like the, the term one-stop shop. This is ideally something you install once, and it runs wherever OpenStack is found. Um, and so, you know, we're, so we're calling this the OpenStack SDK. And SDK is a fairly um, standard term, uh, software development kit. But what it entails is roughly the same uh, across the board. But you know, just to put it out there, it's a set of libraries, tools, documentation, and examples that allow you to um, work with OpenStack. It's going to be uh, a set of libraries that work with all these services, the command line clients. Um, OpenStack client is an existing library that actually wants to consume uh, the libraries that we're working on. Um, documentation, and not just API documentation, which we're working on, it's, um, but equal documentation across the board. If you look at the documentation of a lot of these other projects, um, you'll see a, a wide range of, of completeness, not just in API docs, but in user documentation, uh, which is the pros like saying, how do I build this service? How do I use this service? Um, telling people what functions and to call and what parameters to pass to them is great. That's a requirement. Like, you have to have that. Um, we actually need to have more about how to build things and how to use, you know, with solid examples, how to use these services. Um, and again, this is the you know, install once, get anywhere. Um, so the target audience, again, as I said, is, is really everybody, um, anyone who's using any OpenStack from any angle for any purpose. Uh, but in order to get started, obviously, we don't want to boil the ocean. Um, working smaller with end users who are building applications on OpenStack and developers of OpenStack projects, so the people who are working with one service that consumes uh, values of another service. Uh, and so some of the goals are, again, to produce uh, a quality set of libraries, tools, and documentation um, that provide a more uniform experience uh, across all of those services and across the, the boundaries between a library and, and, and a command line tool or, or any other tools that we might be producing. Uh, again, that documentation is you know, the, full su the full spectrum of, of what you would want to know uh, when working with this. Um, so in terms of library goals, um, my earlier examples with everyone having their own HTTP layer, um, gone, one of them. You only need one. Um, one, ba one base class that covers as much as we can. Obviously, services may have things they need to um, get from there. Uh, as they're customizing things or as you know, things just happen to work differently for other services. Um, having one solid base class that with everyone in the same, everyone's, you know, all these projects all working together in the same kind of namespace um, makes it so you can actually, you know, subclass the, you know, our, our base thing versus copy and pasting into your own project. Um, consistent interfaces, another, another key thing. Uh, the way we've built this, um, on top of all the lower level you know, communications type stuff, there's a resource layer that everything is built on 
that represents the, the server side side resource and creating consist consistent interfaces at that resource layer as well as the higher level um, where most consumers will, will work with this. Uh, it's something we're actually working on actively right now. Uh, we're trying to a couple different ways uh, of working with this and uh, as we show in some of these examples and, and, and pass around later, um, hopefully you can help us um, as users and let us know um, which way you want to work with this stuff. Um, and you know, we'll go that way and, and make sure we have consistency across the board so we're not doing get underscore account to receive your containers and, and we're not you know, perpetuating a lot of the um, old naming and stuff like that. Uh, coming to naming, clear naming. Um, trying to get rid of the whole Nova, Swift, Clance, a lot of the, um, the project names that we all know internally. Um, those are not really useful to a lot of end users. Um, compute, object storage, images um, are, are more useful names. It's, it's very, very clear when you import, do from OpenStack, import compute, that you're working with compute. Um, import Nova, um, we kind of have to tell a story um, why that is where the name came from, why you have to import Nova to work with servers. Um, clear names like that, I think, are, are helpful across the board, especially as this is going to grow outside of the, the core contributors, because everyone here probably knows what Nova is, and everyone would like to import Nova and work with it. But uh, the people who are buying, who are customers of any of the vendors in here, um, people who are, are, are running this stuff at universities, don't really want to have to know the backstory and the history of names. And as, as you know, we all change names as trademark things come up. I don't want to have to import Sahara, which is something aliased from Savannah, import whatever that story is. You know, we want to make sure the, the, the project that it works on is, is not going to change. So use those names as much as possible. Uh, the tool goals are very similar to the, the libraries. They're going to be built on top of the libraries. Um, same thing with, with creating nice, consistent interfaces um, across the board. Um, OpenStack client. Um, is run by the famous uh, Dean Schreier. Um, <laughs> he works on it too. Uh, a lot of people do. Uh, it's a command line tool that is looking at actually uh, consuming th this SDK, the libraries from this SDK, um, eventually to, to produce the, the command line tools for each of the services um, versus how it is now with you know, importing a lot of those different clients and, and making things work across the board. Um, and then documentation. Again, this is you know composed of um, any type of documentation we can come up with to, to make sure our users are uh, well informed of what's going on. They don't have to know the kind of inside baseball of, of how the services work. Um, they don't have to have the you don't have they don't have to follow OpenStack Dev to know this stuff. You know we should be able to just put out there um, nice and plainly in plain English without having prior knowledge of, of a lot of this stuff and say, to work with this project, you have to do this. And here's how you build you know, these examples, how, how you solve these problems uh, that you might have solved elsewhere or on other, other platforms. Uh, here's how OpenStack does it. Here's how this project does it. Um, ideally, we're going to have a ton of documentation. Uh, that's something we're going to start working on. We're going to look a little bit on it with the API docs. But um, coming out with a, a really good complete set um, of documentation that allows people to to come to one spot, get their answers, and not have to resort the first time to go into Stack Overflow and the mailing lists. Ideally, ideally we can solve a lot of that up front by uh, really solid and complete documentation. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Terry, who's going to run through uh, some code examples we have. All right. All right step back here. I'm live. Yeah, I wanted to kind of start out talking about uh, what it's like to work with the SDK from uh, the user persona. Uh, and then we'll get a little bit more into what it's like with a developer persona. There's two main uh, user-facing classes, the connection class and the user preference class. And uh, this is pretty much, uh, you know, ideally this, these would be the only classes you'd really be interacting with as a user. Um, the connection class, um, you basically set it up, and uh, there's several arguments you could pass to it, but a minimum set you need to pass in some authentication information. So you would create your connection, and um, the connection kind of is the, it, I like to think of it more as the glue that kind of holds together everything. Um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, we get into more detail on the connection. But examples of using um, the connection, once you've created one, um, 
you typically can access uh, a service by just specifying the service name, and it dynamically loads these service names. Um, and you would say, you know, for instance, connection.identity.findProject, and you would get a particular project. Um, once you have um, a, a, a resource, you know, from the, uh, from the API, you can act, act on it without specifying the, the, the service name because within the, the resource itself, it knows what service it's related to. And so you could say connection.update project after you've made your changes. Um, uh, and the same interface is available through, uh, you could still, you know, use that project uh, object and pass it into the, the identity uh, update project method if you wanted to. Um, the user preference class, um, and I had to liven this up a little bit and add a picture Neo with a matrix example, just something, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, the user preference class is, um, is where you basically store all, all your, uh, your, your wants as far as which service you want to talk to, where you want to talk to it, what version, um, and um, also pot potentially the visibility of, of the URL that you want to talk to if you want to talk to an admin or a public uh, interface. Some services are available you know, through multiple uh, visibilities. Um, so that's it. All right. And I, as an example, I kind of wanted to, and maybe I should try and see if I can get this example going. Uh, I can escape out of that. And if I can mouse without seeing, but here we go. I need to get that. There we go. I have this example. It's, it's in Garrett right now as a review, but um, this is an example of kind of running the, and there it started. So let me just, how can I move this? Okay, yeah. So that's going to take a little while because, so it's actually created a server already and it's waiting for the server to come up, but. While that's working, and we'll see if it does work, is you know who knows, but um, this is what the example is doing, and this is kind of a somewhat simplified. Uh, you know, the the example itself is kind of designed to be idempotent, like you can run it over and over again, and hopefully get the same result. But um, in order to create a network, you would just say you know network dot create. Um, um, it's, you know, we're going to go through the steps. We're going to create a network, and we're going to create a subnet. We're going to create a router, and here we're just creating our subnet. And um, uh, that's about it. Um, next, we're creating a router. Um, and we're using our external network ID there that we extracted earlier. And we go through and create security groups. And the key pair for our server. And then finally, we get down to, and this is kind of uh, greatly simplified from the example that's in the code, but um, we're, we're going to create a server. And um, so here we're using Cloud init to app get install Jenkins. And in, in this case, in order to install Jenkins, you're going to need, you know, you're going to need to add a repo to uh, app get and do app get update to refresh what the repo knows about. And also, I added like a basic kind of security thing where you could uh, at least have a login so your Jenkins server isn't um, just able to access by anyone. So that's what I did in the example. But here, we're just using this simple example. We're passing in our user data here uh, for Cloud.net. Uh, we've associated our network and our key and our image and flavor and our name. And, uh, and it actually calls it create. After we're done our create, um, it's going to create an IP. And then um, this is the part that was running uh, when we were last looking at the example. It's calling this wait for, wait for status. And this, by default, it uh, uh, expects to wait for an active status. But you could pass a, a different status if you wanted to wait for that. Um, and then finally, we're going to add uh, the IP. Um, to the port that is associated. So this first line is getting the port uh, from the particular, we have server ID over there. Uh, it's using the device ID in that uh, as a filter. And then we assign that floating IP to our port. Um, and this, oh, is, this is, I'll take this one. Yeah. So uh, to kind of contrast 
the, uh, the way a lot of that was done with passing in some of those um, you know, dictionary uh, for keyword arguments, um, and then also operating on the resource that was returned. Um, I wrote up a little, uh, most of Swift is, is um, implemented in our, in our high level in that for that connection class. Um, and the kind of simple example is point out of the directory, recurs recursively log that directory and upload those, um, the contents of that directory to, um, to object storage, to Swift. And simply using os.walk, uh, awesome function, um, just pointed at that, and then very simply the, the container name, so get that out of the, 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 the directory. Uh, object store dot create container, just give it a string, it'll create that. Um, whereas the other way kind of, um, and, and you'll see if you look at some of these other examples, um, build things up with those um, other arguments or you get back um, a resource and pass the resource into cr cr uh, create container, uh, that nice string name I thought was a different way to do it. Um, it makes it pretty nice as one simple line. Uh, walk through that directory, um, give it a little pattern, and just find the files that match. So if you do star.jpg, it'll just run through your directory, upload everything. Uh, simply just say, you know, create container, uh, create object in that container, give it the, the data, the name of the file, and very simply in a handful of lines, most of which are just Python standard library stuff. Um, upload that whole directory. So I think it's pretty easy. Hopefully, um, take a look at some of these examples. Uh, we'll, we'll probably put together like a blog post, and we'll, we'll go through some of these examples and kind of contrast the differences and hopefully have people check it out, um, see how you, how you want to interact with this stuff. Um, and then hopefully we make some, some awesome APIs. Go to you. OK, uh, that was kind of a uh, discussion from the user uh, persona. and. Now I wanted to kind of get in a little bit more of well, from the developer persona, like, well, you know, what does this look like from a high level? And you guys have seen the connection class, and uh, on the far right, uh, you've seen the user preference class, um, and within that, the the guy that actually is holding the the these things, and that's why I call the connection the glue, is the session object, and the session is kind of built on a quasi uh, OSI model type of uh, thinking in that it holds the authentication information and it will make sure that your authentication is there and up to date and it supports a full, you know, kind of HTTP get put, et cetera. Um, let's go on the next slide. We're going to get into some more detail. So here's the session object. And uh, the reason I kind of call it the glue is because it's the one that, well, well, no, actually, take that back. The connection was the glue. The session is the context, kind of, because it holds the uh, transport and the authentication information and the user preferences. Um, so in order to use the session, um, we're going to, and actually, I made this example way, way before I knew anything about Paris, and I happened to pick uh, this famous French pilot, um, Who's, the interesting thing about uh, Roland Garros was he was uh, one of the guys that um, was uh, involved in getting the uh, forward-facing machine gun to not hit the propeller, which I thought was really interesting. But, uh, so the session object, um, you'd create your session object with your transport and your authentication, authentication and your preferences, and then from there you could ac use it as, as a you know, a basic HTTP object, but it's going to do your authentication for you. It's going to, if your token's about to expire, it's going to get a new one. If you don't have a token yet, it's going to get one. Um, and then it'll, it just acts on the authenticator in a kind of, in a, in a known way. It's going to just try to authenticate with that. Um, the transport object, which actually uh, Dean put together, and Dean is here somewhere, I saw him earlier, but um, this is one of the first classes that was put out there, but this does your basic transport layer type HTTP uh, work, and it also adds in some uh, uh, some JSON handling for us. And this is the guy that's derived off the re uh, request object. And uh, I think the, uh, the request object is actually called session, which is a little confusing. Um, but um, so it does basic gets and puts. Um, the auth plugins were... Uh, uh, originally, Jamie Lennox put together the auth plugins over in the Keystone client, and we kind of brought those over and kind of took out the, the material that was kind of in the Keystone client for backwards compatibility. And, um, and we've kind of uh, simplified them a little bit as well. Um, uh, 
Um, right now, there's you could auth with v3 auth or v2 auth. Those are the two that we support. Um, it's a plugin architecture, which I think I'll get into later. Uh, so you, different uh, authentication plugins could be added. Uh, but you know, in this example, we're just doing some user pass authentication. Um, we pass in our arguments, and then we give that to our um, we give it a transport and let it authorize. So the, the authentication plugin is using a transport as well. Um, so yeah, I guess in here I'm getting in a little bit more about the auth plugins. Um, we're using Stevedore to uh, load the authentication plugins, and that's using entry points um, so that uh, other people could add their own plugin if they wished. Um, and uh, currently we're supporting, as I mentioned before, identity v2 and identity v3. Um, token and user pass, uh, and they can add their own. Um, so a little bit more about the internals. Uh, you guys are within the connection class, it's, uh, it's adding a bunch of these proxy objects. And the proxy objects are, for each service, there's going to be a proxy that um, would kind of define which methods are available. Like, the, for example, in the earlier one, there was the find projects. So the identity proxy is going to have a find projects. That proxy itself is going to uh, access a resource implementation. And in the example I just gave, that would be like a project uh, resource. It's derived off this resource object, um, which kind of does our what we would expect for uh, basic CRUD operations. Um, this guy is, uh, as I recall, and I, I'm not sure exactly, I think it was derived off a, a collection multi, multi-map. Uh, do you remember? Yes. Multi, yeah, it's multi-map, I think. So it acts like a dictionary or whatever. Um, so here's our, our proxy object, an example of that. Um, it will hold a copy of the session, so it has a context with what to work. And you would just... It has a bunch of methods like this that are very simple. You know, I want to create an IP, and so it's going to get the floating IP uh, resource, and you know, with whatever data you may have passed, uh, and use call create, passing create the session. Um, the resource itself. So this is kind of an example of uh, how a resource is implemented, and it's you know, it's fairly simple to add a new resource. I mean, your key things are you're going to add a uh, you know, a, a plural and a non-plural resource key, which you would expect to come back in your responses so it can parse the response. Uh, and you add a base path, which is going to be whatever is going to be added onto your URL to access that resource. Um, these base paths can also contain other keys, of course. So, um, and it's going to expect to extract those other keys from within the resource. Like if you had a... Um, uh, any kind of like a, a security group rule, you know, it would add the security uh, group that the rule is associated with potentially in the path. Um, <coughs> the resource itself also has a, a, uh, the service that's associated to, so it knows how to get an endpoint. Um, and then it goes in uh, with these resource properties. They're, um, the, these are optional. The, the, re the properties that are in there don't necessarily need to be here, but these are kind of for convenience. Uh, you can do some basic type checking, as you see here. A couple of these resources are integers, so if you try and you know to set one of those, it would complain that this is not the the correct type. And the nice thing about these properties is that this is where one of the places where we'll um, kind of figure out some of the inconsistencies with uh, kind of naming and things that are coming back. Uh, you know, you have a lot of a lot of names that come back in a camel case or. Uh, all caps or different stuff like that. And if we're going to work with those from within Python, this is where we kind of normalize that to be the kind of pep8 with, you know, underscore separated. So that is public. Obviously, that if, if you, we even tried to set that OS uh, dash flavor dash whatever um, as a, a property on a Python object, it's not even syntactically correct because of the, the hyphen. So we kind of make it a nice nicer name to work with. Is public is a pretty, uh, obviously that's on the end of it anyway, but... Uh, it's kind of make some corrections at this level so we kind of smooth things out uh, for users. Um, now, as far as performance considerations, uh, we haven't done any kind of performance testing with this. Um, but uh, the SDK itself is, is a fairly thin layer. Um, uh, you could argue that it could be thinner. 
but it's fairly thin. Um, it shouldn't have a huge impact. The transport class has the potential to be reused among multiple connections, so you could potentially get some performance help there because uh, you could have maybe a connection um, associated with maybe a different project. Uh, uh, and then the performance that we are going to get is probably going to be more reliant on the Python request uh, package. You know, whatever performance you would get out of that is what you would get with this. Um, installation of the SDK right now, we have an alpha release out. And we've had a, a kind of a dev release out before this, but um, basic pip install Python OpenStack SDK. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a 0.1.0 .0 release right now, which has pretty much what you've seen here. Um, so it's highly subject to change, and we'd actually <laughs> prefer it change. Uh, prefer people to take a look at it, let us know what they think. Um, try to build out some trivial little examples, spin up a Jenkins server, write files to, uh, you know, Swift, stuff like that. Uh, those are the ma Right now it's uh, Swift, Nova, parts of Neutron, yeah, I think the actual the, the Neutron support is uh, pretty good. Okay. Uh, compute is, uh, yeah, pretty good as well. I get, and I think I think Steve Lewis put together most of telemetry, right? Yeah. Um, what else is there? All the basic. There's Trove. I think the Trove support is half decent, yeah. and we have orchestration, but it's almost nothing. Yeah. So there's enough to kind of toy around, build. Some, and I don't put this in production, by the way. Uh, take a look at it. Let us know what you think of the interfaces, how it, how it is to work with it. Um, and yeah, pip install is pretty easy. Uh, uh, yeah, here's some links that might be useful. Our, our GitHub repo um, and our wiki and, uh, of course, our reviews. And we have a ton of reviews out there right now. Um, and we also have uh, regular meetings, Tuesday, 1900 UTC on uh, OpenStack Meeting 3 channel. And I think that's about it, right? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. I guess come up to the microphone, I think. Yeah, that could. Yeah, so, uh, okay. yeah. so the question was, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, scripts right now that we are using the older SDKs. And let's say if we move to the newer ones, is there going to be support for the older one? I mean, how do we transition to, let's say, start using the you know, newer ones? Like you mentioned, you know, instead of Nova client and stuff, you'll have compute. Mm -hmm. So uh, how is how somebody supposed to do that? So I'm not, we haven't really talked like migration plan or how to, how to move from this stuff. Um, I imagine this will be available and those things will, over time, over a long period of time, given the way deprecation works and the way these releases work, even if this stuff was ready, I don't know, for the next, for today, it's not, Nova Client and those type of things will probably be around for a couple more uh, releases. Okay. I think they will probably just live in parallel. I don't know of any plan to say, make Nova Client work with right. this under the hood or, or any of those other clients. I imagine it will just be, this is there and this is there and one of them eventually goes away and one of them, um, if it works out, one of them takes over. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing that, uh, I mean, I don't know, because I'm fairly new, maybe six months, you know, into this, but uh, one thing that I always found, you know, because I use the APIs a lot, uh, is the SDKs, you know, you unless you go into the code, you know, it's, there's not a whole lot of information out there. You know, it'd be good to have some sort of SDK, you know, going forward, at least with the new APIs that, you know, that'll really help, you know, folks to actually use them. Yeah, hopefully we'll cover the whole documentation issue, and uh, you know, obviously the, the the libraries out there are really kind of designed more to be uh, a CLI than right. a library. Okay. So uh, you know, we're kind of trying to focus on that's our our first use case SDK. <laughs> yeah. And since we were trying to get this code working for these examples, documentation is slightly lagging, at least on my side. Uh, at the next week or so, hmm. hammer on docs and get it to where it's up to speed, and so it should be. Better. And obviously, as we build this out, keep going with that. I think in that sense, you know, uh, I mean, I can get on the IRC and I can have some of the other folks in my team. Okay, great. Great. Um, in regards to the discrepancies you notice in some of the APIs, are you intending to push changes upstream to the actual projects to normalize the APIs as well? 
Is there, is there a sort of an overriding goal to make the RESTful interfaces look uh, cleaner amongst the projects as well? So we haven't looked into that uh, yet. We could. Um, so right now, we're focusing on, on getting rough, rough compatibility with what's available on the client side. Uh, in terms of the, of the, the, the breadth of features that are there, um, in terms of pushing that influence to the, to the server side, uh, and, and what the, the REST API is giving back, um, that hasn't really come up until, as far as I'm concerned, or, or know about right now. Um, I th it's something to think about. Um, uh, that's probably more of a long-term goal, though, I think. Yeah, so, and, for and sure. right now, also, I guess we have to support the current API. So, like, yeah. hey, there's some cases already where, oh, filtering doesn't work on this API, so we've written a, you know, a different find method for a particular object so the filtering works on that object. So, you had a question? Yeah, uh, you said this is, you know, not production alpha. Do, should we expect some of the APIs to actually, or the, the library functions to actually change, or if we write a script, it's gonna keep functioning forward? I mean, what what is it about it that makes it not production or alpha? Is it just not fully implemented, or things can change, we'll have to go back and change our scripts? and. So it's a little bit of, so right now, I, I was telling the story earlier. So like our, the, the session and transport and HTTP stuff, think of it as a pretty solid core. It's round, it's spherical. We then, for the resource layer, which is the one that, that interacts directly with uh, the REST APIs, that's kind of not fully spherical. We haven't built everything out, and we haven't, full, if, if for every API we've added uh, support for at the, at the resource layer, we haven't gone full out on all of them. Because we're trying to make sure we don't want to go, we don't want to build everything, and then realize we had to change it, and then we had to change everything. So we've built out a good amount of that, and then on top of that, we've built out some of the higher level, the connection, the, the proxies that go to connection. So really, this looks more like a football uh, than anything. So before we really fill everything in, I want to make sure that the ends of that, that high level, are are, are good and solid. Uh, I don't suspect there will be a huge amount of change. I mean. The functions are going to still be the same. I think you know what you pass to them may or may not change uh, as we start to figure out what's the best way. Because like my my Swift uh, example with uh, the create container, just give it a string. Um, we have to f none of the other ones support that right now. They're they're more on uh, keyword arguments of that cor correspond directly to what's on that resource, or you give it a resource. Um, so it's a little bit of a different angle. Uh, so th I, there are going to be changes, but I don't think it's going to be anything super drastic. Um, potentially backwards incompatible with you know it's a, a, the, the time to do it, but it's it's we're not too rigid to the point where I would d build things that are seriously going to depend on it. Um, but I, I would expect small changes, and then once we get that figured out, fill on the entire sphere. The the current uh, client uh, CLI does some. Uh, client-side validation. Does this SDK do any validation, or does it just pass the data in for like configuration? Well, if you have uh, the particular properties when you're when you're putting them in a resource, it would validate those properties as you put them in. Um, but that's all. It's, we try to keep pretty light on the validation um, because it's hard for the SDK to keep up with changes within the API. We don't want to get where people can't use it because it's too rigid. Right. Thanks. Yeah, this is less a question than a suggestion. It seems that oftentimes with open source projects that the documentation lags way behind and finding an advocate who specifically focuses on the documentation uh, sometimes works better because oftentimes the people who are doing the development uh, don't have the time and whatever the real focus on actually getting the code developed. So it's, it's nice to have the documentation move ahead separate from the developers. Okay. I think. If I could, I would have uh, Garrett would gate on the proper documentation being in there, if that was even a possibility. Yeah. What about question. error checking? Are there any plans to coordinate with the sub-projects to have some kind of error uh, handling that uh, passes up the information of the call stack or something like that? Um, I mean, right now we're we're trying to grab as much information as we can out of uh, like an error response and populate it into our exception, and um, that's pretty much you know the best we can do. We, we're trying to be a fairly you know kind of thin layer on that, I guess, and it's hard to code to all the different possibilities. 
does this uh, in, uh, is this included in dev stack? Um, so if I just install Ice House, does this automatically got installed that I can use? No, it's uh, completely. This is a Stackforge project, and it's um, you would have to manually install it uh, separately. Separately. So yeah. how how do you uh, second question? How do you handle the like the different versions for the same API? For instance, like yeah, the Keystone. That's a good question. There's a there's a whole and, and it's not actually complete in the SDK, um, but there's a whole uh, versioning problem and it's handled some of the situations because you have you know what the user wants, uh, what the SDK provides, uh, what's in your service catalog, and potentially what's in uh, the versions API on the particular you know REST interface, and you know right now we're kind of. We're trying to, uh, we match up basically with user preference. Uh, we'll use whatever version they request. If they requested a special version, we'll just try and use that. Uh, you know, if they said they wanted 2.1, the, uh, you know, the, the API uh, would try to use that. Um, so that's kind of where, where we're lacking, I guess, is actually querying to the versions interface and, you know, seeing, well, what does it really support? Um, potentially, if the ver if the user select a version that's not in the service catalog. Any other questions? I guess that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for coming, and check out the project, and, and let us know what you think. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>